The US is by far the world leading superpower. However, this is rapidly changing with the rise of China and growing discontent with the current world order. Hey Slavic Vikings and welcome to the last continent in our series, North America. A captivating continent that stretches from the icy realms of the Arctic to the tropical paradise of the Caribbean. Compromising 23 countries and many overseas territories, North America is by far dominated by the COM countries, or Canada, USA and Mexico. Starting with the Sea of COM, Canada. Canada is basically America that refused independence from the British, but later changed their mind and they drew this long line to separate themselves. This is the world's longest straight international border. The peaceful administration of such a long border signifies that Canada and the US have built a relationship symbolized by friendship and partnership. But this hasn't always been the case. Like the War of 1812, where American forces attempted to invade Canada. Economically, the US and Canada are highly interdependent. This has led to both cooperation and disputes. The recent negotiations over NAFTA, now rebranded as the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, you can see how hard they're trying to avoid the COM acronym, uh, these countries have brought light to contentious issues such as dairy tariffs and automotive trade rules. The USMCA reflects a recalibration in economic relationships accommodating new realities and ensuring the continued free flow of goods, but not without rigorous negotiations. The countries jointly participate in the NORA Defense Pact, monitoring aerospace and maritime warnings in North America. They have also engaged in the Smart Border Declaration, aiming to enhance security while facilitating lawful trade and travel. Within NATO, Canada's underinvestment in the military has caused friction. While committing to the alliance's collective security, Canada's defense spending falls short of the agreed upon target of 2%, leading to criticism over fellow NATO members. The French speaking province of Quebec is a uniquely Canadian problem in North America, where French is not just a language, but an identity. This linguistic and cultural tie adds another layer to Canada's international dynamics, especially with France. The push for Quebec's sovereignty has shaped Canadian politics for decades. Efforts to recognize French as an official language alongside English have been significant, but remain a contentious issue. The Quebec people therefore are close to the French with that having an impact on Canadian-French relations. Canada's northern territories are at the forefront of the main geopolitical focus in the next century, especially as climate change opens new shipping routes and resources. The biggest city of Alaska, Anchorage, is one of the major population centers around the Arctic Circle and may be crucial for Canada's future ambitions in the region. Hans Island is a small uninhabited island in the Arctic Ocean that was claimed by both Canada and Denmark. The two countries have been in a wholesome dispute over the islands for decades, with each side occasionally sending officials to plant their flag and leave behind a bottle of their respective national liqueur with the Danish leaving snaps and the Canadians leaving whiskey. In 2022, Canada and Denmark finally agreed to split Hans Island in half. The agreement to split Hans Island was signed just days after Russia invaded Ukraine. This timing was no coincidence. Canada and Denmark wanted to send a message to Putin and the world that there is a better way to resolve disputes than through war. They wanted to show that even in the most difficult of times, diplomacy is always the better option. I know I somewhat covered Greenland in the Europe video, 
because it is a colony of a European power and politically aligns more with the EU, but technically, geographically, it is part of North America. This is also evident with the cultural similarities of the Inuit people in Greenland and North Canada. I have a friend that's from north of Greenland and he often mentions the huge impact of Denmark in this country. Denmark on one hand brought modern technology and luxuries that totally changed Greenlandic perspectives and standards of living. But on the other hand, Denmark brought disease and forced assimilation. For example, by taking native children to Copenhagen to indoctrinate Greenlandic youth with Danish values. But I genuinely believe that the European modern comforts that are rapidly changing every Greenlandic's way of life is not beneficial to their happiness or well-being. Greenland has one of the highest suicide rates in the world, with 11.4 deaths per 100,000 people in 2020 alone. This is more than twice the global average of 5.5. It also has a higher rate of depression and is ranked one of the least happy countries on earth. In Denmark, the Greenlandic person has a stereotype of being a drunk. Greenland has one of the highest rates of alcohol consumption in the world. In 2016, the average Greenlandic adult consumed 10.9 liters of pure alcohol per year, which is more than twice the global average of 5.3 liters per year. There seems to be a suspicious correlation between alcohol consumption and suicide rates, but recently there has been a huge revival of awareness of the aforementioned issues. And it seems like both Greenland and Denmark are working hard to combat them. Greenland receives an annual block grant from Denmark of 3.9 billion kroner, which is roughly 511 million dollars. This grant accounts for approximately 20% of Greenland's GDP and more than half of the public budget. This investment is a double-edged sword with it being a primary reason for Greenlandic culture disappearing. This also makes Greenland economically dependent on Denmark, which is how it remains as one of the last modern colonies on Earth. But why does Denmark spend so much money and effort on Greenland? Well, the earlier mentioned global warming is showing to make the Arctic a very important landscape for geopolitics in the near future. Because of potential natural resources under the snow and new accessible maritime trade routes. This importance was recently seen by Trump, who wanted to buy the island from Denmark. The Danish government and people thought that this was absurd since Greenland has become a crucial part of Danish culture and pride. But however goofy Trump may be, this wasn't such an outlandish proposal. Since the US literally bought the Virgin Islands from Denmark in 1917, which was also a colony of Denmark. Plus, the attempt of buying Greenland by the US has been attempted three times before Trump in history. The first after buying Alaska, the second President William Howard Taft sent a representative to Denmark to discuss the possibility of the purchase, and third President Harry Truman offered Denmark $100 million, equivalent to $1.3 billion today. Every single time, Denmark rejects the US's offer, not even negotiating. Right now, there isn't much of a Greenlandic independence movement, mostly because of these huge investments. But I genuinely believe that once enough snow has melted for the huge reserves of natural resources to become available for extraction and the Arctic Sea to be navigable, Greenland will just proclaim its independence. So I'm not sure if Denmark's plan is going to work. 
Speaking of independence, now perhaps the most independent country from the US in North America. Just 90 miles south of Florida, Cuba is America's closest communist neighbor. The most exciting thing that happened with Cuba in recent times is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Under the rule of Fidel Castro, this intense moment in the Cold War signifies Cuba's modern discontent with the USA. This conflict isn't just about America's hate towards communism, but also because of the US's colonial history on the island. Cuba has endured a grim economic downturn, much of it cast by crippling sanctions. The US embargo, often referred to in Cuba as El Bloqueo or the Blockade, has been the most prolonged and stringent set of trade and travel restrictions in modern history. While it's intended to pressure the Cuban regime into democratic reforms, its most tangible result has been the suffering of the Cuban populace. People love using countries like Cuba or Venezuela as examples for why communism doesn't work not taking into account the severe effects of being sanctioned by the world's biggest economic power. President Obama notably attempted a loosening in relations. Under his tenure, embassies were reopened, travel eased, and the narrative was one of reconciliation. However, Trump's presidency swung the pendulum back to a hardline stance. Trade restrictions tightened and the warmth of Obama's years turned icy cold once more. And Biden, as with everything, has a boring nuanced approach without real action. Historically tied to the Soviet Union, its position was clear during the Cold War. Defiant, rebellious and fiercely independent. Today, its eyes are more diversified but remain defined by their shared opposition or ambivalence towards the US. Countries like Venezuela, with whom they share ideological parallels, China, with its economic might, and Russia, a vestige of the Cold War alliances, have become crucial partners. Yet, it's not all about hard power and economic alliances. Soft power, particularly medical diplomacy, has been one of Cuba's masterstrokes. Dispatching doctors worldwide, from disaster zones to pandemics, it has not only earned them the goodwill, but also positioned them as a significant global health player. Just east of Cuba, on the same island shared with Haiti, sits the Dominican Republic, an intriguing juxtaposition to its communist neighbor. During the Cold War, the Dominican Republic, under the dictatorship of Rafael Trujillo, actively opposed Castro's regime in Cuba. But times change and so do stances. Today, they are cordial, but still not friends. Dominican Republic's most contentious narrative revolves around its relationship with its immediate neighbor, Haiti. The two share the island of Hispaniola and their shared history is marred with disputes over territory, trade and cultural differences. The Parsley Massacre of 1937, ordered by Trujillo, where thousands of Haitians were brutally killed, is a dark chapter that still echoes in their bilateral ties. However, not all of Dominican Republic's international relationships are thorny. The US is a significant trade partner with many Dominicans living stateside, forming a vibrant diaspora that influences both economics and culture. Within the Caribbean community, CARICOM, the nation sits as just an observer, hinting at its regional significance and ambition. Moreover, its membership in the Central American Integration System, or SICA, underscores its pivot towards Central America in trade and diplomacy, instead of the Caribbean. Because of these factors, the Dominican Republic positions itself as a bridge of sorts, with the Caribbean on one side and the Central American community on the other. 
It serves as a connecting node for trade, especially in the era of globalized economies. Throw in the country's bustling tourism industry and you've got a nation that has been one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America. Moving on to its evil twin, Haiti. Maybe less evil and more depressing since it is often considered the poorest country on earth and is seriously suffering from fuel and food shortages, as well as mass violence and diseases like cholera. Recently, the UN has even set uh, troops to be sent there. Haiti starks contrast to its neighbor, the Dominican Republic. This divide isn't just evident in economic statistics, but also deeply rooted in their colonial histories. While the Dominican Republic was once under Spanish rule, Haiti was colonized by the French. This split led to two different languages, two different cultures, but unfortunately a shared history of turmoil. Haiti's struggles aren't just a result of recent crises. They stem from a combination of its turbulent past. From being the first black republic to gain independence after a successful slave revolt in 1804, to facing numerous dictatorships, foreign interventions and devastating natural disasters. The 2010 earthquake alone claimed over 200,000 lives, pushing an already fragile nation further into the brink. I'll now talk briefly on this successful slave revolt since it involved Poland. So the famous Napoleon freed Poland and made it a somewhat independent state and a strong ally. Therefore, a Polish legion was initially sent by Napoleon in 1802 to quell the slave uprising. Many Polish soldiers got deeply moved by the Haitian fight for freedom and it reminded them of their own country's struggle against foreign domination. Ultimately, they sided with the Haitian rebels. Recognizing their shared aspiration for liberty and their mutual plight under oppressive regimes. These Polish soldiers turned their backs on their original mission, aiding the Haitian cause. Their contribution is still remembered today with a small Polish community in Haiti. Haiti's historical mistrust of its wealthier neighbor, the Dominican Republic, is marked by events like the aforementioned Parsley Massacre. This divide has had real-world consequences, impacting trade diplomacy and the daily lives of Haitians near the border. On a global scale, Haiti has often been in the US's backyard, sometimes for support, but often facing intervention. From Bill Clinton's military intervention in the 90s to reinstate President Artestide to the continuous foreign aid, the relationship is a complex one. Many argue that the dependency on foreign aid has stymied local industry and self-sufficiency, but at least that's better than getting cubified. Light up a joint because next up we have the land of the green. Jamaica. Jamaica's strategic location in the Caribbean makes it a pivotal player in regional politics. Historically, as a former British colony, Jamaica has maintained close ties with the UK. Upon gaining independence in 1962, the country soon became a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, a political association of 54 member states, mostly former territories of the British Empire. In the 1970s, under the leadership of Michael Manley, Jamaica championed a new international economic order, which sought to level the economic playing field between the developed North and the developing South. This was a bold move, and it placed Jamaica at the center of global economic debates during that era. In the modern context, one of Jamaica's primary challenges has been its economic debt. While it has made significant strides in recent years in fiscal discipline and structural reforms, the nation's debt remains a significant concern. 
And where there's depth, China comes in to save the day with no strings attached. And so China, seeing Jamaica in depth, decided to make investments in infrastructure projects from roads to ports so that it can potentially eventually leverage the fact that Jamaica will be too high on weed and their debts to repay. Setting our sights even further south in the Caribbean, we land on Trinidad and Tobago, a twin island nation that is just 15 kilometers away from the South American country of Venezuela. First off, unlike many of its Caribbean neighbors, Trinidad and Tobago isn't just about sandy beaches and smokable sticks. It's an energy powerhouse. The islands are rich in oil and natural gas, which have been a backbone in their economy for decades. This energy wealth places them at a unique advantage, but also exposes them to the global swings of energy prices. Overall, a similar situation to Venezuela. Historically tied to the British Empire, Trinidad and Tobago gained independence in 1962, becoming a republic in 1976. Despite this departure, British influence is still evident in its legal and educational systems. English, after all, remains the official language, and cricket is more of a religion here than just a sport. Geopolitically, its proximity to Venezuela, a nation that is not known for its regional stability and peacekeeping, forces it to play a bit of a delicate dance. While they have engaged in various energy agreements and a joint exploration treaty with their South American neighbor, the ongoing Venezuelan crisis has led to an influx of refugees into their lands straining local resources and stirring tensions. During this series, I've mentioned the Chinese investment trap so many times that it has become repetitive and boring. But geopolitically, it's important, so I have to mention that this country is yet another place where China is using this debt trap to control them. The United States, given its role as the hegemon in the Western Hemisphere, is a significant trade partner. Just how the Chinese are attracted to debt, the US is attracted to oil. And therefore, the US is particularly keen on ensuring the security of energy resources on these islands. Now the Bahamas, the most known tourist archipelago containing 700 beautiful islands and over 2000 Ks. Historically a British colony, the Bahamas achieved independence in 73, though it opted to remain a member of the Commonwealth. With Queen Elizabeth II, I mean King Charles, as the ceremonial monarch. This historical tie to the British has molded its political and judicial systems. Economically, tourism and banking are the behemoths. Its pristine beaches and crystal clear waters magnetize millions of tourists yearly, predominantly from the US, which is just 80 kilometers away. This geographical proximity to the US has fostered an intricate relationship, not just in tourism, but in trade, investment, and even matters of defense. However, there's a shadowy side to this financial picture. The nation has occasionally found itself on blacklists for being a potential tax haven for money laundering. The EU and other global entities have eyed the Bahamian banking sector with suspicion, prompting the nation to reinforce its financial regulations to avoid potential sanctions. Geopolitically, the Bahamas' location makes it a strategic point of countering drug trafficking routes from South America to the US. American Coast Guard's patrols have bilateral agreements between the US and the Bahamas to keep the illicit activities at bay. Moving on to another past British colony starting with the same two letters, Barbados gained its independence in 1966. However, it only recently removed the Queen as its head of state which was clearly the last straw that was holding her to life. Therefore, Barbados transitioned to the newest republic on earth in 2021. And while you might not think that cutting ties with the British monarch 
would equate to an embrace in isolationism, this is very much not true, since Barbados has always been a loud international player and remains as such. Other than some drama with Trinidad and Tobago over maritime boundaries, Barbados has remained very peaceful. Barbados, rather than being a nation of conflicts, it has been one of diplomacy and alliances. As a member of CARICOM, it's been a voice for regional cooperation, emphasizing the shared challenges and opportunities among Caribbean countries. Furthermore, with its membership in the Organization of American States and the United Nations, Barbados is not shy about chiming in on broader global issues. And it has used this voice to bring awareness to global warming, since its vulnerability to rising sea levels and increasing intense hurricanes have been very intense. Wowee, Britain really had an impact on this region, since we are now covering another former UK colony. Saint Lucia. However, it is worth remembering that it was several times exchanged with France. There isn't much to say about this small country, other than maybe it was once close to Taiwan, but sadly once again potential investments and diplomatic support is swaying Saint Lucia towards Beijing. Yet another country that got ping-ponged in between the French and the UK is St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Compromising the main island of St. Vincent and a sprinkle of smaller Grenadine islands is once again another Caribbean country that became independent from the British. In the realm of friendship and international relations, SVG is a dedicated member of the Caribbean community. Through this union, SVG collaborates on issues that matter to the Caribbean, from economic policies to that ever-looming threat of climate change. After all, when you're a group of island nations, rising sea levels isn't just an environmental concern, it's a danger that potentially hinders your nation's existence. But unlike St. Lucia, this country has the balls to stay with Taiwan and recognize them to this day. Now St. Kitts and Navis. Honestly, this part of the video is pretty boring since all I can say about this country is the same as the one before. It recognizes Taiwan and doesn't want to sink because of global warming. Guess who else recognizes Taiwan and doesn't want to sink? That's right, Grenada. But hey, finally something interesting. This nation produces a third of the world's nutmeg. I'm starting to understand why this continent was chosen last in the polls I made. In 1983, the US under President Ronald Reagan decided to intervene militarily in Grenada. Officially dubbed Operation Urgent Fury, this invasion was allegedly to protect American medical students on the island, but let's be honest, it was more about preventing the spread of communism and expanding influence. Although Grenada does hold a slight grudge, you can't be angry at your biggest trading partner and tourism supplier forever. Venezuela and Cuba have been historical allies, especially in terms of medical and educational support, but this isn't a stick it to the US alliance. It's more nuanced, based on the shared goals and mutual respect. Not to be mixed up with the Dominican Republic, Dominica also recognizes Taiwan over China, a choice which often ruffles feathers in international circles. Dominica is an active member of CARICOM, pushing for regional unity and collaboration. Geopolitically, the US and the UK are significant trading partners and remain close. Their citizenship by investment program is catching the eye of many, being one of the only countries on earth that you can buy yourself a citizenship into. Moving on to the last Caribbean country on the list. This might be my least favorite region in the world, at least when it comes to geopolitics. Actually, maybe Oceania is worse. But maybe I'm doing my research wrong since it seems like there's nothing interesting happening here. 
Antigua and Barbuda is a former UK colony recognizes Taiwan and has a similar pay us to get citizenship policy. So those were all the countries in the Caribbean, but I haven't covered the many islands that are owned by countries not in North America. But I need a break from this boring region, so I'll cover them later. Now the country you have all been waiting for, the center of the universe and the inventors of freedom, the United States of America. In this sprawling panorama of global politics, few nations display a division as stark as the US, with its deep-seated bipolarity of Democrats and Republicans. This seemingly endless two-sided conflict might be seen by some as a fundamental element of US democracy. However, in the past this was not the case, with modern US history being defined by many political parties having influence. A nation as diverse and multifaceted as the US can't be adequately represented by just two political factions. Unlike European nations, where multiple parties often reflect a vast range of ideologies and values. Consider the multitude in Germany's Bundestag, or the Dutch House of Representatives. The US's system forces a binary choice upon its citizens. This often leads to individuals to feel their complex beliefs are boxed into categories that don't truly re resonate with them. Of course, keeping things black and white helps uneducated Americans being involved in politics. And at the end of the day, politics in the US are meant to entertain and engage people into the culture war in order to solidify this bilateral divide. The heightened us versus the them mentality, especially prevalent in recent years, has rendered the US Congress frequently paralyzed. Compromises become a rarity, replaced with partition standoffs that do little to advance the nation's needs. In contrast, multi-party European parliaments often necessitate coalitions to form a government. This inherently demands compromise and collaboration leading to a more adaptable and often more stable political environment. The confluence of media, celebrity and politics in the US has given rise to a new breed of politics, one that often feels more akin to reality TV than genuine public service. The 24-7 news cycle coupled with the omnipresence of social media places an emphasis on sensational headlines over substantive political discourse. Candidates become brands, campaigns become productions, and real issues often take a backseat. Gerrymandering stands as a testament to the lengths parties will go to ensure their dominance. By manipulating electoral district boundaries, parties can virtually guarantee victories in specific regions. This not only undermines the very essence of a democratic representation, but further solidifies the two-party stranglehold. For all its economic might, the US presents an intriguing conundrum. It boasts the title of the world's richest country, yet beneath this facade lies a plethora of inequalities and incongruities that challenge the very essence of the American dream. While the US prides itself on being the land of the free, studies have shown that it might not be the freest. For instance, certain indices place Australia higher in terms of political, personal and economic freedoms. The reasons are manifold, from difference in healthcare access to disparities in criminal justice. I won't even go into the awful slave-like criminal justice system in the US. Although the US has an impressive GDP, its average living standard is pathetic, compared to what it should be. A comparison with Denmark, often ranked among the top countries in living standards, reveals stark differences. Whether it's in terms of healthcare education or soft social safety nets, Denmark consistently outpaces the US, despite the latter's capitalist fetish. Delving into more granular data, the US shows more disparities. There are states where the survival birth rate is lower than in developing countries like Bangladesh. The US globally renowned as a bastion of capitalism 
surprisingly isn't the easiest place to start a business. Again, taking Denmark as reference, the Scandinavian nation ranks higher in ease of doing business and ease of starting a business. Post-World War II, the geopolitical identity of the US went a monumental transformation. Rooted in its role in its world wars, especially the latter, the US cemented its place as the world's primary superpower. Two primary narratives dominate this period. Its capitalization on global economic shifts post-World War II and the ensuing global Cold War with the USSR. While many global powers found their economies decimated by the wars, the US saw an opportunity to capitalize. The lend lease policy wherein the US supplied allied nations with vital resources bolstered its economic position. This policy, although rooted in supporting allies, also helped the US establish itself as the globe's economic hegemony. After the world wars, the US painted its international interventions under the broad brush of containing communism. Yet, a deeper dive suggests an agenda centered around expanding influence, or how I like to call it, modern imperialism. Some examples of this are in the Korean War, Vietnam War, Angolan War, and many more. This shows that if a country is not in a political union with other countries, it will inherently become imperialist, especially if it has the power to do so. This is something that the European Union has successfully stopped. Proof of my earlier statement is that the collapse of the Soviet Union didn't bring an end to US interventions. Their involvement in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria and the drone strikes in Pakistan underlines that the Cold War was just a veneer for deeper geopolitical ambitions. The US's Monroe Doctrine and later the Roosevelt Corollary essentially proclaimed its hegemony over the Western Hemisphere, pledging to protect or intervene in both South and North American affairs. This protection, however, often manifested as interventions, sometimes covert, sometimes overt, in nations like Chile, Nicaragua and Grenada. China, now a juggernaut in the global economy, embodies a peculiar relationship with the US. Biggest non-neighboring trading partner, yet also biggest geopolitical rival. This duality reflects in their interactions, from trade wars to diplomatic spats. While the US officially recognizes the People's Republic of China over Taiwan, it continues to maintain an intricate relationship with the latter, pledging to protect Taiwan the US often finds itself balancing between supporting a democratic ally and avoiding direct confrontation with China. I talked more on the contested waters of the South China Sea in the Asia video, but in short the US's freedom of navigation operations here aim to challenge China's territorial claims, leading to increased tensions. This freedom of navigation in practice is US boats deliberately sailing through Chinese claimed waters, often near Chinese island military bases, in order to show that freedom doesn't care about any nine lines. The US is de facto the leader of NATO, with over 70% of the NATO budget coming from them. After the Second World War, it proclaimed itself as the protector of Europe with many countries loving this relationship, especially Poland, which is dependent on the US to scare Russia. Other than that, the two continents are very close. However, the US does not tolerate any signs of EU dominance. For example, it went to war with Libya just because they started selling their oil in euros instead of dollars. The recent love for Ukraine, primarily through arms and financial aid, is not just a humanitarian gesture. The war in Ukraine has been the best geopolitical tool for the US. It's killing two birds with one stone, or three birds if you count the Ukrainians. It is actively crippling its historical rival with Russia, 
both economically and diplomatically. The war also benefits the US's arms industry tremendously, highlighting the intricate interplay of geopolitics and economics. Other than the thousands of military bases all around the world, the US has some colonies in the Caribbean as well. Starting with the Virgin Islands, the US procured these islands from Denmark in 1917. Not only for their funny name, but mainly for their strategic location. As the US citizens, the residents have certain rights, yet they don't have the privilege of voting in US presidential elections. They do, however, send a non-voting delegate to the US Congress reflecting their unique semi-autonomous nature of their political status. Hundreds of years ago, when bird poop was discovered to be amazing fertilizer, the US signed the Guano Islands Act, which allowed any American to claim any random island they find. And Navassa is one of those islands. Sitting between the shores of Haiti and Jamaica, it is uninhabited. The island used to be full of delicious potent bird poop, but these days the hustle and bustle of phosphate mining have long passed. Among all the US territories, Puerto Rico stands out. Not just for its size, but its profound historical and cultural significance. Seized by the US in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War in 1898, Puerto Rico remains the most populous of all US territories. Puerto Ricans have been proud US citizens since 1917, but their unique position means they neither can vote in presidential elections, even though they also contribute a non-voting representative to Congress. So that was the US. I feel like I was a bit harsh on the Americans, so I want to make it clear that I would still rather live under the hegemony and the rule of the US rather than China or Russia. So things could be worse, but I still would rather much the US to cooperate with other countries more instead of what I would call conquering. Moving on to British overseas territories in North America, we start with the famous Bermuda. Known for the Bermuda Triangle, this island awkwardly is far away from all its island neighbors. Historically, Bermuda played a significant role as a naval and air station, especially during World War II, serving as a crucial refueling stop. Today, its economy is heavily driven by insurance and other financial services. Obviously, Bermuda maintains a close relationship with the United Kingdom but has also been influenced by American culture and economy due to its proximity to the US. There have been internal debates on independence, but a 1995 referendum saw Bermudans overwhelmingly vote to remain a British territory. Positioned southeast of the Bahamas, the Turks and Caicos Islands boast an extensive coral reef system, while tourism, fishing and offshore banking form its economic backbone, geopolitically the islands hold strategic significance due to their location. There have been discussions over the years about the possibility of these islands integrating with Canada, so the Canadians could have a warm place to rest. Though the idea hasn't gained substantial traction, relations with the Bahamas are also very good given the geographical proximity and shared cultural history. Renowned as a major world offshore financial center, the Cayman Islands hold a special place in global finance. Located in the Western Caribbean Sea, the relationship with Britain is defined by mutual respect. However, the islands often face scrutiny over their banking secrecy with internal pressures pushing for greater transparency. Moving on to Anguilla. This slender eel-shaped island in the Caribbean was once part of the St. Kitts Nevis Anguilla Federation. However, in 1967, Anguillans revolted, 
leading to its separation and eventual establishment as a standalone British overseas territory. Monsterrat is unfortunately best known for its catastrophic volcanic eruptions in the 1990s, which devastated large parts of the island. This disaster led to British aid and intervention, reinforcing the deep ties between the two. While most residents are UK passport holders, there's a unique blend of British and Caribbean influences on the island. However, its reliance on British aid, especially post the volcanic eruptions, puts it in a unique position concerning autonomy and governance. I hate covering the Caribbean and covering these overseas territories is even more boring than just countries alone. So now I'll try to speed my way through the Dutch colonies in North America. First stop, Aruba. Though a constituent country to the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, Aruba enjoys considerable autonomy, but the Dutch still handle defense and foreign affairs. Over to Curacao, despite embracing its Dutch roots, there's been chatter about its future political status. For now though, it operates as a constituent country. Then there's Bonaire, which together with the next two countries form the BES Islands. Sint Eustatius, or Stacia, historically was a major trading hub. Saba takes heights seriously, home to Mount Scenery, the highest point in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, it's quite literally a peak in the Caribbean. And let's not forget Sint Martin. Interestingly, this island is divided with France with the northern French part being called Saint Martin and the Dutch sovereign part Sint Martin. Both countries cooperate a lot and are close with each other and their rulers. Speaking of French islands, now the overseas collectivities of France in North America. Starting up north, closer to Canada than the Caribbean, are the chilly islands of Saint Pierre and Miquelon. These islands remain the last vestige of France's once expansive North American possessions, which were sold by Napoleon because he was focusing more on Europe, maybe smartly so, but uh, moving on, their bond with France remains sturdy, though there's an unmistakable Canadian influence thanks to geography. Switching to a sunnier note, Guadeloupe and Martinique as overseas departments are as much part of France as Brest or Anus in France. Formerly a part of Guadeloupe, Saint Bartholomew became an overseas territory in the early 2000s, giving it a degree of autonomy. Finally, we are done with the boring mess of the Caribbean, and now we can move on to Central America. Starting with the sovereignmost country in North America and moving up from there, Panama. Like I mentioned in the South America video, the US is responsible for Panama's existence and therefore it has played a dominant role in Panama for much of the 20th century, primarily due to its ownership of the canal. Tensions eventually led to the Torrijos Carter Treaties in 1977 which laid out the eventual transfer of the canal's control from the US to Panama in 1999. Geopolitically, Panama has always been a neutral player focusing on partnership that enhances its economic prosperity and stability. However, it started recognizing the People's Republic of China over Taiwan in 2017. This is especially concerning to the US since the US sees the Panama as its region of influence. The relationship between Costa Rica and Panama is largely characterized by cooperation and mutual respect, but the region of Bocas del Toro and the Coto area sparked tensions in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. However, arbitration in 1905 by the French Chief Justice of Court of Cassation laid these disputes largely to rest. 
Since then, the two countries have fostered a friendly relationship focusing on regional cooperation, trade, and tackling shared challenges like drug trafficking. Remarkably, Costa Rica stands out for its decision to abolish its armed forces in 1948. The budget, which might otherwise have been dedicated to military endeavors, is instead allocated towards education, healthcare, and conservation. This move has solidified Costa Rica's reputation as a peaceful and progressive nation. Costa Rica has a territorial and maritime dispute, however, with Nicaragua, especially around the San Juan River. Both nations have taken their claims to the International Court of Justice, with rulings generally favoring Costa Rica's stance. Beyond its southern neighbor, Nicaragua finds itself in a position of regional importance. The Sandinista National Liberation Front, or FSLN, which led the charge against the Somoza dictatorship in the late 1970s, remains a significant political force. Economically, Nicaragua has had its challenges. Once among the poorest countries in the Americas, it has made efforts to attract foreign investment and boost sectors like agriculture, manufacturing, and mining. Nicaragua has generally maintained non-aligned stances, balancing relations with both the US and countries like Russia and Venezuela. The proposed Nicaraguan Canal, though still just an idea, remains a point of geopolitical intrigue, with potential to significantly alter trade routes and regional balances of power. For example, by taking away Panama's biggest leverage of being the only transit in the area. In the early 2000s, the International Court of Justice settled the long-standing maritime dispute between Honduras, Nicaragua and Colombia, redrawing the nautical boundaries in the Caribbean Sea. Honduras, like its Central American counterparts, grapples with challenges like drug trafficking and gang violence. Its strategic location makes it vulnerable as a transit point for narcotics heading to the US. Consequently, its relationship with the United States has been dominated by security and anti-narcotics cooperation, with the US providing significant assistance in these areas. And then we get another W for North America, since Honduras also recognizes Taiwan. One of the most notable incidents between Honduras and El Salvador was the football war in 1969 which despite its name had underlying causes related to land and immigration issues. The skirmishes, though short-lived, underscored tensions that had been simmering beneath the surface. Nicaragua was also involved in the conflict through its strong support of Honduras. The aftermath of the conflict led to the signing of the 1980 General Peace Treaty which aimed at resolving border issues. This marked the beginning of a slow yet deliberate journey towards rapprochement. Today, both nations have made significant strides in fostering bilateral cooperation, particularly in trade security and environmental conservation. On the economic front, El Salvador, similar to its neighbors, is striving to transform from a traditionally agrarian economy the country has placed its bets on sectors like manufacturing and service to fuel growth. The US remains a vital trading partner and the dollarization of its economy in 2001 has further cemented this economic interdependence. Like El Salvador, Guatemala has faced its internal demons. The brutal 36-year-long civil war which ended in 1996 left deep societal scars. The war was a testament to the nation's systemic inequalities and divisions. The peace accords of 1996 aimed to bridge these divides, but their full implementation remains a work in progress. In recent years, the specter of organized crime and gang violence has cast a long shadow over Guatemala's efforts of nation building. These challenges of addressing the root cause of emigration, predominantly to the United States, has dominated the bilateral agenda with Washington. 
Geopolitically, Guatemala has exhibited an oscillating stance. While historically anchored to the US for security and economic reasons, recent years have seen a pivot towards other global players, including European and Asian nations. The relationship with Belize is marked by a long-standing territorial dispute, stemming from colonial-era contentions between the British and Spanish empires. Guatemala laid claim to a significant portion of Belize's territory. This dispute persisted even after Belize's independence in 1981. However, in a significant move towards resolution, a 2018 popular referendum in Belize paved the way for the dispute to be taken to the International Court of Justice. Although the territorial contention has not been fully resolved, both nations continue to maintain diplomatic ties. Belize has been judicious in forging its international ties. Its membership in the Caribbean community underlines its Caribbean orientation while its engagement in the Central American integration system emphasizes its Central American connections. While maintaining a cordial relationship with the United States, Belize has also expanded its diplomatic horizons, establishing ties with nations like Taiwan, much to the disappointment of China. Looking northward, Belize's relationship with Mexico is characterized by mutual respect and collaboration. Speaking of, now Mexico. At the crossroads of North and Central America, Mexico occupies a unique position, both geographically and geopolitically. It not only shares a vast border with the US, but also maintains significant ties with Central American nations. These connections with countries like Guatemala, Belize and Honduras extend beyond mere geography encompassing shared cultural elements, trade relations, and at times, the challenges of posed immigration. This brings us to Mexico's intricate relationship with the US. A key flashpoint in recent years was the immigration issue, with Trump wanting to force Mexico to fund a wall that would encompass the entire border, not helping relations. This wall never got built, by the way. But nowadays, Republicans plan to do military operations in Mexico, which sounds similar to what Putin is doing. Mexican emigration to the US, driven largely by the quest for improved economic opportunities, also points towards the challenges back home notably the specter of gang violence and influence of powerful drug cartels, which is the reason why Republicans want a military intervention in Mexico. Cities like Ciudad Juarez have unfortunately become synonymous with this violence, impacting not just the local populace, but also having broader geopolitical implications. The power and reach of cartels their rivalry for control over lucrative drug routes into the US and their influence over local law enforcement and politics have become pressing issues, necessitating international cooperation. Yet Mexico's narrative is not solely one of challenges. In recent years, it's making concentrated efforts to diversify and boost its economy, keen to shed the label of merely being a manufacturing hub. Companies like Amazon have recognized Mexico's potential, setting up factories and viewing it as a viable alternative to China, especially given its proximity to the US market. However, Mexico's ambitions on the global stage aren't without their hurdles. Territorial disputes like the ones over the Chamizalg area with the US or the Basalar Chico area with Belize have been historical points of contention though most have been resolved through diplomacy. Geopolitically, Mexico's position is undeniably significant. A member of the G20, it has increasingly sought to assert its voice on the global platforms, championing causes ranging from climate change to equitable trade. 
its role in regional bodies like the Pacific Alliance and its trilateral engagements with the US and Canada under the USMCA underscore its pivotal role in shaping the region's destiny. So that was it for North America, bringing us to the end of this series of geopolitics of the world. Or maybe not, maybe there will be a bonus episode. Subscribe to find out, and as always, Favel, Jegnam, and goodbye.